for you old guys, this is not a Big Crosby, Bob Hope uh, movie. So. <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to start this off with a college basketball note. Everybody remembers the Fab Five, right? From Michigan, five freshmen started. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they did not play college basketball in 1622, but on March 12, 1622, five saints were canonized from Spain. I think we've heard some of these guys. Those are the colleges next to it, Ignatius Lee. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's their high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think you've heard of all these people, right? So far. So far. And Got it. Got this guy. Saint Isidore, Saint uh, Philip Mary. Mary. Okay. So these were five saints, and we're going like, who is this guy? Saint Isidore. I was actually given this assignment a couple years ago, and it's interesting when you give an assignment, you they, they evolve. And I think the fact that mm. this fellow is unknown is important. Don alluded to the fact that we have St. Joseph, one of his feast days is what, St. Joseph the Worker? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. St. Isidore was a farmer or a laborer. His parents were devout Catholics. He was lived from 1070 to 1130. His parents were devout Catholics and he was, they were poor. So he was basically given to a, uh, a landowner and he worked for that guy for his entire life. Some of the legends, some of the stories are that St. Isidore went to Mass every day in and around Madrid. So just think about it. When do, because I want to ask this question later, when do farmers start farming? Yeah, so when's, when's morning Mass usually? 8.30 in Carrollton, Texas, a thousand years later. So everybody else is starting to work at dawn. <clears throat> St. Isidore rolls up after morning mass. So if you're his buddy, he's working with him, what are you thinking? He's not pretty, pretty heck of Yeah, not, not, not the most popular guy on the team, right? So the legend has it that the angels would be plowing the fields with Isidore doing the work of two or three men. Or that Isidore would, would be praying and the angels would be driving the plow. So that's the legend. Whether, that's, you know, whether those are true stories or not, I don't know. But what's really important here is that at this time, how many people were agrarian at that time? Everybody. <laughs> so they actually got to have the quote unquote, their own, even in, even in the 1600s, okay? They had one of their own be canonized. Plus what? He was married. He was a layman. He had one child that died as a child. That was pretty important to those kind of people. So I want to go through an exercise. One is, think in your own lifetime, how many generations back people were farmers in your family? I can go back two generations. Central Minnesota, both my mother and my father came from farming communities. When they both turned 18, what was the first thing they did? They ran to the city. Yeah, they ran to the city. They did not want to live on the farm. And then subsequently, when I was a kid, where did I have to go to visit my grandparents? The farm. And I hated the farm, and they knew it. They knew it. I wasn't comfortable there. So if you go about around the corner, how many generations ago were your relatives farming? Most of you, Probably the same boat. That that apparently whether they were whether they, whether they were dairy farmers or crop farmers or whatever they were. Is it any more than two generations? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So we have a lot more in common with St. Louis North than we might think. My, my, my grandkids, they don't have a clue what a farm is. They don't have a clue about milk, vegetables. They don't, you know, they don't, know, where, they don't know where food comes from, literally. Yeah, it comes from the grocery store, Walmart. <laughs> That's right, exactly right. So let's just separate this from the standpoint of farming to what we do today. And I know there's, you know, you know, I'm a, you know, today in today's society, what is the biggest <coughs> growing portion of employment in the United States? No. <laughs> you, always got, you always got some political guy in the room. The cranky, the cranky old guy in the room. Truth hurts. So services. Services is probably the, the biggest thing. Yeah, I remember my dad worked in an office. So when I grew up, I wanted to work in an office. I'd go down there on Saturdays and be with him. And I really didn't have a clue what it was meant to be. So like I'm, you know, at heart I'm a financial guy, but really I'm just, I'm just, I, I manage people. So I'm just a glorified psychologist. That's all I do. So if we go around the table, what do you guys have? So not think of Donald, your teacher, educator, Gilbert. Gilbert, Gilbert taught me a new word in that same trip weekend. He taught me that he was a glazier. I had no idea what a glazier was. The man that works with glass, he's artisan that works with glass. So that's what Gilbert's. That was a guy who put stuff on donuts. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> important position. To go. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't laugh. I keep on asking my grandson what he wants to be, and he grows up. For one year, he wanted to work in a donut shop, and I go, why? And he did free donuts. <laughs> I worked at a pizza parlor as a kid. After I quit that job, I didn't have pizza for five years. <laughs> So what you're out, what historically some of you guys what are your occupation what are you guys done for a living? No, teaching. Teaching. Engineering business owner. Management and technical support. I was a truck driver. Truck. Speaker trainer. Speak. Insurance for forty years. But he's not there. I'm just glad to be out. <laughs> Purchase. Procurement and human resources. Uh oh. Okay. Well, it's like corporate, but my first job was a caddy. <laughs> well, I don't have the 10 legs anymore. <laughs> uh, medical sales. Patricia's. You know, and guys often identify themselves with their occupation. You, know, you introduce yourself, you know, we always make sure like, you, you, about the fifth thing you say is that you're Catholic. You know, you say either, I, this is what I do for a living, this is, I'm a, I got kids. You go through all this list of things, and then, like, the fifth thing you say is the cat. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> the idea, though, is that, and Don has talked about this before, is that it's important work is good. Greed is not, greed is a challenge, but work itself is good. And I think with St. Joseph and with St. Isidore, that is, that is the premise, is that work is good. You offer up your fruits, and you take the skills that God has given you, and you manifest it. And not all of us are gonna be Religious people. We're going to be ordinary people in society, and I think that's what Saint Isidore is trying to bring to the table: is this concept of doing what we've been asked to do, do it well, and do it in a reverent manner. So, some of you guys are in areas where you have uh, fairly strong fiduciary responsibilities. What does that word mean, fiduciary? Fiscal. Money. Well, it has to do with money, but you, you do. Trust. You're yeah, working on somebody's behalf. You're, you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're. The 
the best interest. Yes, best interest of whoever the other party is. Not it's not in your self interest. It's in the best interest of who you're who you're taking care of. And that's what that's what we're asked to do. Whether you're building a product, you know, you're not. You, if you're doing the product right, you don't really need to have a warranty. If you're if you're giving your customer the right product, uh, they're going to come back. So the same way as Isidore took care of the the landowner, we're called to do the same thing. And that's a witness of the gospel as well. Yeah. And I, I think. At this time, you know, the, the number of lay people that were canonized at that time probably was, was extremely limited. And I, and I, I've preached about this many, many times that, you know, Vatican II emphasizes this fact that the laity have a important role in the church, <coughs> in the community. That, you know, we got two priests, two deacons, and a half dozen people on staff. All the other stuff happens from us, from within. You know, nobody in the ivory tower down the hall started Joe Catholic. That came from within the parish. The men's conference we had here, the women's conference we just had two weeks ago, you know, that came from within the parish. Because I remember we were having the men's conference and we were handing out stuff and women would go to me and they'd go, what about us? And I said, well, what about you? <laughs> you, know, you want it, you gotta do it. They did. And they did. <laughs> and you know, so some people in this parish, you know, chirp is a challenging word to them. But I, I, once I worked with Sandy on it, and, it, and I tell you right now guys, man, if I tell Sandy it's raining outside, she's gonna not take an umbrella. And I finally got her to understand that putting on a men's conference weekend or a women's conference weekend is like putting on a church weekend. You've got to have different people doing different roles. Not everybody's going to be the spiritual director. Not everybody's going to be the lay director. Not everybody's going to be the witness. You've got to have people in the trenches doing stuff. 